Hi everyone, so in this tutorial I'm going to show you how to draw a horse eye in pastels. Now regardless of the size of the portrait that I'm working on, my first step is I want to make sure that I've got the shape of the eye accurate. So if I'm working on light paper and I'm using the white pastel mat for this, I do like to put in my darks first. So I'm just paying attention to the darker sections of the eyelid, potentially the pupil, and that is it at this stage. If I was working on a darker paper, something like the dark grey pastel mat, then I would also be putting in my darks exactly as I am here. But if there was any particularly bright highlights, like the white reflections in the eye or the lower part of the eyelid, then I'd also be mapping those in now. But obviously I don't have to do that here because as you can see, I'm now allowing the white of the paper to show through by putting in my darks first. So that is gonna depend on the paper color that you have chosen to work from. Now the reason why I like to take my time at this stage and map in my main shapes is because horse eyes are very different to any other animal. Now that being said, I will still follow these processes when working with eyes of any other subject, but with horses, particularly on the lower part of the eye, you are gonna have quite a few creases and highlights and shadows that we wanna make sure that we get accurate. Now here I'm just taking a lighter grey so I can map in some of those lighter mid-tones and again this is where I'm reinforcing the shape. You can see I'm really taking my time here to make sure that I've got that accurate. Now if I change the shape of the eye it will, it will also change the expression of that horse so that's why I take it so seriously at this stage to get that shape as accurate to that photo as I possibly can. And the good thing about taking our time at this stage is once that shape of the eye is accurate, it's in place. So I can make sure then that I can focus on the color of the iris, the reflections, once I know I've got the outer section of that eye done. Now, as you start to work on the areas on the outside of the eye, those sections of eyelid, just as it starts to meet the fur, you'll notice there that it starts to potentially curve. You can see here at the corner of the eye, how it starts to curve down towards the lower right corner. All of that curve, the highlights, the shadows, the shape, the way we move those pencils is following the underlying bone and muscular structure. Now this is something I cover in depth in my Patreon tutorials because it's really important. If I don't move my pencil in that way where I can see the highlight and shadow is curved, I will make that face potentially look more two dimensional, maybe more rigid because I haven't followed the natural structure. You can see here how I was curving my pencil strokes at the top part of this area of the eyelid and that there is going to help to make it look like it rolls over onto the outer surface of that eye socket and then it merges onto the skull. So the way that we're moving the pencil here is so important. So at this stage I was happy with the shape of the eye and now I'm going to start working on the reflection and the iris. Now, as you can see here, I am explaining things as I'm going because this tutorial is available on my Patreon channel, all in real time, no parts sped up or cut out. And I'm explaining here the importance of values, what we're gonna be doing when we're building up our layers and so on. But the one important thing here is if you do have a highlight in the eye that's particularly bright, then you wanna be mapping that in first, or if you're working on the white paper, just allow that white to show through. You can always add a white pastel pencil over the top if you want to, but you do wanna be making sure that that's as bright as you can get it. Because quite often, if you do have a particularly bright reflection in the eye, it's gonna be one of the most brightest parts of that entire portrait. So what I wouldn't do in that situation is put a grey down for the highlight or a blue if you've got reflection from the sky and then put your white on top. Although we have the benefit of layering our lights over darks with pastels and it's a very, very versatile medium, if you do have a particularly bright highlight, I do find it's best to put that in first and then you can always layer your darker or additional colours on top of that if you need to tone that down. Now the one thing that this tutorial on Patreon focuses on, because it is all in real time, is how to select your colours, how to prevent muddying up of your colours, because that can happen quite easily when you're working with the reds and oranges, which this horse will be, that lovely chestnut colour. And also when we're working on the eye, one of the most important things is how to build up that sphere three-dimensional shape. Now you can see that I'm already starting to indicate it that here, and that's all by the values of my pencil. 
Now what I mean by that is I am selecting a range of brown pencils that is the lovely beautiful colour of this eye however it's based on whether or not I should be using a light brown or a dark brown. So colour selection is one of the most common questions that I'm asked here on YouTube and social media and that's why I do like to focus my Patreon tutorials on that as much as I can. Now I do believe that the contrast, the values, your lights and your darks are more important than worrying about the exact colour because the contrast is going to what is going to make that portrait look more three dimensional but of course the colour is still important. Now I have a very simple method for breaking down which pencil we should be using for what we can see in our reference photo and of course that's going to be easier for me to explain in those real time tutorials so if that's of interest I will link my Patreon in the description below. However you can see here by this process that each pencil I'm selecting that is different it's just that it is darker. So that here is where I'm reinforcing the darker edges of the eye and it's by doing this that we're going to build up that three dimensional sphere shape. If we don't have the shadows right on the edge or particularly the top which we're going to get to in a moment with the reflection then we will make it look like that eye is completely flat and that it's not rounded and curved at the sides and of course that's the look that we want to go for. Now the other thing that's going to affect that is how we're moving the pencil. So we don't want to be working with straight lines. There should always be a degree of curve to your pencil strokes. And that's demonstrated perfectly with these details here. You can see that it's following the shape of the darker part of the eyelid that we put in to start with. Now the reflections on the eyes, they are going to vary to a degree because it might be reflecting um, a tree or even sometimes the person taking the photograph is visible in the eye. So of course it's going to be very subjective. But normally when we're painting or drawing anything that's to do with nature, animals, anything like that, trees, grass, there are no straight lines. There is going to always be a degree of shape and curve to the pencil strokes that we create. And even now when I'm reinforcing the lighter value of the iris colour, I'm always paying attention to my values and this is something again that I talk about all the time in my Patreon tutorials. Although I was using two different pencils to get a little bit of colour and a lighter colour on top, I'm always aware of how bright that should be. Now what I mean by that is, I'm always looking at the eye itself and thinking where is the brightest highlight? because the iris should not be in this instance as bright as that reflection above it. Now when we're working on an eye and we're only focusing on the iris colour, I do find that sometimes we have a tendency to add too many brighter highlights and by the time we then finish that eye we've noticed that we've gone too bright and we need to tone that down. Now that's fine because with pastels we can layer from dark to light and then light to dark if we do realise that we've done that slight mistake. So it's very easily fixed but by looking at the entire eye and thinking okay this part should not be as bright as the highlight we can help to build up more of that realism and depth within the eye a little bit earlier on and we can avoid those mistakes that take a few minutes to fix. Now the one thing I can't stress enough is if you do make a mistake like that it doesn't matter at all it happens all the time. As I've said, it's really versatile with, with pastels. We can layer our darks over lights. We can put our lights back over the darks as long as we don't fill the tooth of the paper. Now, this is a question that I'm asked quite often and you'll know if you fill the tooth of the paper because your pencil will feel like it's gliding and it's slick over the top of your existing layers. If you have that happen and also the, the pastel of that pencil does not come out of that pencil at all, it just doesn't grip, that is a good indication that you filled the tooth of the paper. Now in those situations it can be um, tricky to fix. You can apply a workable fixative to that and that will help to get some tooth back to the paper but it's always with the understanding that you're probably going to have some kind of colour shift because the fixative does make that change with the colours once it's applied because you are putting that wet based fixative over the top of your pastels. Now I do find that the couple of times I've used fixatives it does lighten back up again. I do find it makes things quite dark. Once it's dried, it might go a little bit lighter, but the colours are never the same as what they were before you applied the fixative. So for me personally, I'm just aware of the layers that I'm adding to avoid filling the tooth of the paper because I do not want to be running the risk of a fixative changing the colours of my artwork. 
However, if I was at this stage here, I wouldn't be so against using a fixative because I've barely started the horse. There are no colours there on the fur that's going to be impacted by the use of a fixative. So that might be an option if you're only at this stage. Um, but it is something to be aware of if you do use a workable fixative throughout your drawing process. Now, if you do use a fixative, there are a couple of things that I would recommend. I would advise to work with two or three lighter layers, making sure that you allow each layer to completely dry before you add the next, rather than applying one heavy layer of fixative. Because what I found is that heavy layer can actually dissolve some of your details. So I find it, ha it is best to work with a couple of lighter layers. The next thing that I would recommend is don't hold that fixative spray bottle close to your surface. I would recommend to put it in a fine mist sprayer bottle so that you avoid getting those heavy droplets of fixative and I would then hold that a foot, foot and a half away from your surface and allow that spray to more widely disperse over your portrait. The closer you hold that you're going to get more of a individual targeted patch and you don't want that. So I would definitely recommend to hold it a little bit more of a distance. So it's at this point here where I decided to start to add some very subtle blue colours within the lower part of the eyelid. Now with some reference photos, as I've said this is very subjective, but if you've got a strong reflection colour in the eyelid, then I would be potentially adding that in a little earlier on than I am here. But if it's subtle, I like to put my main base foundation first and then I'll just tint that colour with a little glaze, a light layer of whatever colour, in this case it was that powder sky blue over the top. So I'm pretty much done with the eye but what I have included in this tutorial is me completing the lower section of the skin where the hair then starts. Now the reason why I've included that in this tutorial is because this is really important when working on horse portraits. You don't want the hair to come straight out from the lower part of the eyelid. They're always going to have either that skin colour showing through or very, very short hairs that are starting around the base of the eye, but certainly not right up to it. So here I'm really taking my time to make sure that I've got that in place to make it look like eventually when I start the fur and the hair that that is going to be on top of the skin and not coming out from the eyelid. Now another reason why this lower section is also important is because I'm going to start to put in those very subtle muted creases on the lower part of the eye. So you can see here I'm just going to hint now at the lower part of the eye socket. If I hadn't have included these here I'm going to make the lower part of the eye look like it almost just stops and obviously that's not what we want. We want it to look like that eye socket is now curving down to where the lower part of the jaw and the cheekbone is going to be. So when I'm starting to work on the outer edges of main elements, like this area here, I'm always thinking, well, what is this part of the face now starting to attach to? Because I have to move my pencil strokes in the right way in order to replicate that. And you can actually see that really clearly here with these subtle creases. You're now starting to see that they're droping down a little bit towards the right side, but starting to taper off down towards the lower right corner whereas everything above it is far more curved in the middle and slopes up a lot more towards the top right corner before it then goes over to the right hand side. So the way that I'm moving my pencils, I can't stress it enough, it's so important for indicating the correct bone and muscular structure of that animal that you're working on. And because not one horse is the same as the other, this is going to vary from the subject that you're drawing. So if this is a pet portrait commission then this here, these tiny little details are really important. It's what makes that person's pet so unique. Now the one thing that I have done is my Patreon does focus on the pet portrait side of things a lot. So when I was first new to doing pet portraits and I started to get inquiries for different types of horses, dog breeds, you really do appreciate then just how much each animal varies and how unique they are. So what I've done is I've tailored my Patreon so that I've got a huge variety of different dog breeds, cats and horses, so that there is something there for everyone. So the tips and techniques that I share in those in-depth tutorials, Patreon members can then apply that to their own pet portrait commissions.
And if you would like to see the tutorials that I do have available on Patreon, then I have a Patreon library on my website. So I'll link that in the description below as well. And that lists all of the tutorials that are immediately available to Patreon as soon as you sign up. Now, the wonderful thing about that is you can stay for as long as you like or you can cancel at any time. It's really flexible. So I really hope that this video has been useful. If it was, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a like and a thumbs up because it makes a huge difference to my channel. And I do upload two to three videos to YouTube every week. So if you would like to get notified of that content, then hit the subscribe and the bell button. I'm going to be uploading another video to YouTube in the next few days. But if you've got any art related questions, feel free to pop them in the comments below because I'm more than happy to help if I can. And as always, thank you so much for watching.